Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our expert discussion event today, Central Asia's role in resolving the Afghan crisis. Uh, as I say, my name is Alan Davis. I'm the Asia director of IWPR. And exactly 20 years ago, I remember co-organizing a similar event held at the Dostum Hotel in Bishkek just a few weeks after 9-11. Back then, there was a lot of attention on how and where the Allied invasion of Afghanistan would launch from. As we know, Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan in particular became important in the context of that crisis, not just in the first months of the war, but for years thereafter. But back to today. And firstly, let me express my sincere gratitude to our keynote speaker, Dr. Ariel Cohen. We highly appreciate your participation. I'd also like to thank Bruce Pannier from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and our distinguished speakers, Jennifer brick uh, Akram Umarov, and Tamin Ezi, for their extensive work on Central Asia and Afghanistan. Their research contributions are helping to shape the critical debate, and their participation today will, I'm sure, shed more light on our understanding of this issue. A reminder that this meeting is part of RDPR series under our project entitled Amplify, Verify, Engage, Information for Democratization and Good Governance in Eurasia. And a reminder too that this project is generously funded by the Royal Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We thank the Norwegian MFA for being our long-term donor and our partner in Eurasia. We are very honored and proud to enjoy their support and look forward to more events like this in the future. So today we will discuss the problems and perspectives of what the region can do as a whole to resolve the multi-dimensional crisis unfolding in Afghanistan after the US-led withdrawal. Typically, the Afghan crisis is analyzed through the prism of the great and regional powers and their existing capabilities to influence, if not determine, the situation in the country. It's a mistake though to forget Central Asia, as while the region's position lacks overall consistency and a united front, it obviously matters considerably, just as it did back in the wake of 9-11. So we'll be discussing the potential of the five stands in relation to what is happening in Afghanistan today. We'll be looking at the influence of the region's political leadership, and we'll be looking at how it can possibly engage in both the short and the midterm. Perhaps too, we'll hear expert analysis from the region that helps Western policymakers improve their own understanding and decision making as regards their engagement on Afghanistan. Today's choice of topic is of the highest concern to the region's citizenry, activists, experts, and CSOs and decision makers. And so RWPR is very happy to see so many people join our event today. I'm looking forward to a very fruitful discussion and thanks very much. Uh, and back to Bruce. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and that gives me the great pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Ariel Cohen, if you please. Unmute yourself, please, Dr. Cohen. Okay, good. Greetings. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor and thanks for the Kingdom of Norway for uh, sponsoring this program. Uh, I think without uh, Western uh, engagement in Central Asia, we would be deaf and blind to what's going on. And I will address that in the future. Uh, today, we are at an inflection point um, as um, COVID became a stress test to the states around the world and in Central Asia, um, the rise of uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan presents another stress test. This is a critical period in the national existence of Central Asian countries, probably the greatest test since 9-11, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, maybe even comparable with um, the uh, influx of the Russian troops in the 1870s um, when 
the independence of the Khanats of Khiva Bukhara in Samarkand was, was uh, lost. Um, the reason I'm comparing it to these stress tests is because you have a new and powerful factor and the reaction that we see uh, throughout the regional capitals uh, indicates how worried the leadership is or the leaderships, plural, are in these capitals. You see President Rahman going to France, you see Foreign Minister Kamilov, Kamilov uh, going to Afghanistan. So did Special Envoy Kazakhan from um, uh, Kazakhstan. You saw Deputy Prime Minister uh, Sardor Umurzakov negotiating uh, in Termez with his Afghan uh, counterpart on economic development. So these are the dots that we as analysts need to connect uh, to discern what uh, is going on, what is the thinking uh, of the uh, local leaderships. We also saw uh, foreigners uh, being involved. We saw just the other day uh, the negotiations in Moscow, statements by Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, by Special Envoy uh, Kabulov uh, and others, uh, visits by American uh, State Department senior officials, uh, Wendy Sherman was in Tashkent, etc. So there's a lot of activity. But behind this activity, we as observers, as analysts, as decision makers, as writers about the region, need to understand what does it all mean. And what it means is that the model of statehood of Central Asia, the agency of Central Asian countries individually, of Central Asian ethnic groups and peoples is challenged by a whole different paradigm, by a whole different concept. And that is the Islamist concept as expressed by different players in Afghanistan. I stress by different players, not just by the Taliban as amorphous and non-centralized as it is, but also by, uh, by other organizations, the Taliban harbors or tolerates or shelters on its territory. Since um, uh, the Peace of, Peace of Westphalia, 1648, it is a nation state that is ultimately responsible for what's going on on the territory they control. So as I'm looking at uh, Afghanistan, I'm looking at the Islamic Party of Turkestan, I'm looking at Hizb al-Tahrir al-Islami, I'm looking at ISIS-K, Al-Qaeda, the Uyghur movements, the um, Islamic Jihad of um, Turkestan. Um, so these are actors that all of them allegedly disregard the ethnicity. I mean, uh, Taliban is clearly a Pashtun movement, but the Islamist paradigm is that these ethnicities do not matter. You have fighters uh, that come from Central Asia, uh, thousands of them that came to Syria, to Iraq uh, and other places for jihad. Uh, they subscribed to this ideology and that ideology, if not checked, if not rendered non-competitive by any means necessary, will challenge the statehoods of newly, still newly uh, independent states. 30 years in history is not a long time. So um, we are looking at the weaknesses of the nation states. We're looking at attempts to appease uh, the new rulers in Kabul by giving them uh, grain or giving them uh, assistance or posturing by making calls to unfreeze uh, the uh, monetary reserves uh, of the previous government of Afghanistan. Um, Gorban Goli Berdemuhamedov the other day called for the unfreezing. 
doesn't cost him a penny. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, as we heard in Moscow, as we hear in Washington, there is a long list of demands that are presented to uh, the government in Kabul. Uh, and these de de demands are material. The purpose, and I submit to you, the purpose of these demands is to render that government less capable, I won't say incapable, less capable of challenging its neighbors and exporting its Islamist model, north, west, east to China, uh, east, southeast to India, et cetera, et cetera. So when we talk about diversity, when we talk about representation of women, when we talk about uh, observance of most basic standards of human rights, this is in order to make that government less of a jihadi or terrorist government and more of a normal quote unquote uh, actor in international affairs. The challenge in Kabul that is directly relevant to Central Asians is whether that is a sui generis, a particularly national emirate, a particular national form of government that is not subject to exports, or this is a model that will be exported. It is the confrontation or competition between, for, for shorter term, for, for uh, just to, to encapsulate the terminology, uh, between an emirate and a caliphate. And as I mentioned, there are actors, including ISIS-K, who are talking about a caliphate, and clearly you don't build a caliphate by staying in Kabul or staying in Kandahar. You do it by exporting that form of government and you do it through a violent jihad. Um, the role of outside players is important. The challenge for the local governments is who are the predominant outside players? Is it going to be still Russia that uh, dominates in the security sphere? Is it going to be China that already dominates in the economic sphere? To what extent Turkey trying to build its Turkic union is going to play a role? Uh, when I was in Tashkent in July, I saw with which respect and um, importance Prime Minister Imran Khan of Pakistan was treated. Uh, they take Pakistan very seriously because of the historic Pakistani connection to the Taliban. Uh, so all these actors will have different influences and different roles. Clearly Turkey will have a higher role, bigger role in Turkic speaking countries and less so let's say in Tajikistan. Uh, you also see the differences between uh, the staunchly anti uh, Taliban position in Dushanbe versus attempts to understand, if not appease, the government uh, in Kabul in other uh, capitals. Uh, Russia very clearly signaled to Tajikistan that they do not, do not want an escalation. They're not ready for the escalation. I, I believe they don't have uh, the means to get engaged in a longer uh, war. And very importantly, the question of this conference, what can the local governments do? They can clean up their act. When you read, as I did this morning, that uh, in order to cross the border uh, into Kyrgyzstan, the Kyrgyz Pagranichniki, the Kyrgyz border guards, are uh, collecting uh, fees uh, from the trucks, the illegal fees uh, into their pockets, when you have reports of corruption day in and day out, when you have many instances of drug trafficking, um, of government that is abusing its powers, that will be the wood that the Taliban and other uh, propagandists will throw into the fire of insurrection if and when it comes to discredit the existing regimes. So the existing regimes should fight for their lives and the legitimacy by cleaning up their act. Um, 
be it uh, in improving services, in improving education, in fully legitimizing the more secular models in comparison with Kabul, which are a complex legacy. We don't have time to go into that. You know, the Soviet legacy, the Western influence of the last 30 years, but the fact that this is a different model and we are in much um, more acute competition of, the, of a model that is more secular, that is more open, that allows women to walk unaccompanied and work and people to travel. Uh, thank goodness um, the American University in Kyrgyzstan took 241 students from Kabul, saved their lives possibly. Uh, and these are the examples of um, what the local people, organizations, and yes, governments can do. Help people who need that to save their lives, to save their future, to embrace them and take them in despite what Mr. Putin may be advising you. And I understand why Russia is so worried. Russia doesn't want an inflow of radical uh, propagandists or worse terrorists to come in from um, Afghanistan and destabilize Central Asia and possibly Muslim areas in Russia. I think my time is running out. I would, would summarize it and say, this is a challenge for the civil society, civil society in each of the five Central Asian states. This is a challenge for regional players, for great powers such as Russia and China. I was saddened to see my country, the United States, not participating in uh, the meeting in Moscow on Afghanistan. I don't know what these technical uh, difficulties that Washington quoted were. I'm sure there were serious. I'm sure US was not getting something out of that meeting. Uh, but I said before and wrote that we made a mistake in the way we disconnected or ran from Afghanistan, we'll pay the price for that. People of Afghanistan will pay the price for it, but it means that we need to rebuild our engagement. We need to rethink it, we need to draw lessons, and we need to re-engage. And hopefully the governments in the region are not burned so badly by the United States that we will find the ways to build the bridges and re-engage with Central Asia again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Cohen, uh, for, for setting the table so well for our discussion that's coming up. That was very uh, broad, broad pic and, and detailed picture about what the current events mean uh, in Afghanistan for Central Asia. I appreciate it. And, um, and now I would like to move on to our first speaker, uh, Jennifer Murtazashvili, uh, who's going to be speaking, I think, about the different approach that the Central Asians are taking to the, what happened in Afghanistan this time compared to what happened previously in uh, 96 and 2001. So please, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Bruce. It's a real honor uh, to be here. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone around the world. And I should just say that the work of the Central Asian Bureau for Analytical Reporting um, just does such amazing work and brings the sharpest voices to the public sphere. And those voices happen to be from Central Asia. So it's just really an honor to be uh, included um, in this discussion. And so I'm going to, to you know, take a take a deep breath and challenge some conventional wisdom. And I'm probably not going to go the entire time uh, that I was allotted uh, because I really want to open things up for discussion and hear what you have to think about some of the things I'm about to say. Um, I think that this is a reminder to us first and foremost that we need to be talking about Central Eurasia and not Central Asia and Afghanistan. And increasingly, uh, we, we talk about post-Soviet states or the five stands, um, what we have seen from this is that over the past 30 years, these countries are independent, they're sovereign, and they have their own foreign policies. So we're here quite, quite a lot uh, in our media, especially here in the West, um, in the United States, about the role of Russia and China, uh, you know, filling in the, the vacuum that, that uh, left by the United States. I think these are some questions that we really have to uh, interrogate over the next uh, hour and a half that we have together. 
So I, I think it's just a reminder that Afghanistan is really a key part of this region. It is not an appendage to it. It is central to it. And what I love about Af Afghanistan, I cultivated this term called the heart of Asia. They created something called the heart of Asia process, which was you know, to bring countries in the region together to create a more open foreign policy. And I really think of central Eurasia, you know, including Afghanistan, to be really the heart of Asia. And it is one region. Um, and so I hope this is really an opportunity for us to think about these countries together. So uh, these, so that the controversial part of what I'm going to say is that I think Central Asian states have met the rise of the Taliban with great confidence. That we are hearing about the vulnerabilities that these countries face, the unexpected fall of the Taliban, uh, I'm sorry, the unexpected fall of the Ghani government, the rise of the Taliban, and the potential threats that this, uh, you know, the, the, the threats that this presents to Central Asian states. And I think from what we are seeing is very different from that, you know, predicted fear. I think what we're seeing is confidence. We're seeing that in the de-Americanization that has taken place in the region, that countries actually have a great deal of agency and Central Asian states are actually in a very good position to pursue their own interests. Yes, China has interests. Yes, Russia has interests. Yes, Pakistan has interests. But the states of Central Asia are in a very good position to play these powers off of one another and pursue their own self-interests. And so while we don't really talk about the interests of these smaller states, we talk about the geopolitical great games and all of this, I think it's a really important moment for Central Asia that unlike 20 years ago, where we were watching what the United States would do, we were watching uh, the basing uh, policies the United States placed. Now we're seeing a very confident Central Asia assert itself, countries develop very divergent foreign policies. And so this confidence is actually vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban. And I know this may sound surprising when we hear about uh, the rise of the Taliban, what this means, it's, it's, there's insecurity, there's instability. And as Dr. Cohen said, that this is indeed a test for the states of Central Asia, but I think it's a test for which they are very prepared and for which I think they even anticipate it. And what do I mean by that? So the war in Afghanistan has gone on for 20 years, and I think many of us were not paying attention to the day-to-day -day fighting that was taking place, to what was happening in the country. I think even the Central Asian uh, publics were not paying much attention to what was going on in Afghanistan from day to day. And what we saw in northern Afghanistan over the past six or seven years was quite calamitous. There was a lot of instability fighting in the region had skyrocketed. The central government had lost control of many parts of the North. And not only did the central government lose control over the North, it was engaged in, I think, what I would call sort of a two-pronged war, a war against the Taliban and the insurgents there, and the associated foreign militant groups that came along with the Taliban, but it was also engaged in a conflict with what we'll call the, the, the warlords, and the, the, the groups of commanders that were traditionally associated with the Northern Alliance in the North. And this is something that really escalated over the past five or six years uh, during the period of Ashraf Ghani's rule, that there was a great deal of contestation between these Northern Alliance groups and the central government. At the same time, there was a fight going on between the central government and the Taliban. And there are some people who will say that even the central government was more preoccupied with weakening these warlords in the north than it was with fighting the Taliban. Now, we can debate whether that's true or not, but this is certainly a perception. But what did that mean for northern Afghanistan? It meant that the region was full of chaos and disorder. Many people had been displaced. The country had seen, uh, the northern parts of Afghanistan had seen mass migration, mass displacement. Um, the International Office of Migration said that around a third of the population had been had uh, migrated forcibly. They, they became IDPs or migrated out of the country since 2013. That's a lot of people. And so if you're a Central Asian state and you're you know, working for the defense ministries or, or security apparatus in, in, in any of these border states and you're looking at the situation in the north, you're seeing that the longer that the United States was in Afghanistan, the worse the security outcomes were for you on your border. 
And so there was a real, I think, loss of faith in the capabilities of the United States. The United States wasn't able to promote order. Certainly the Afghan government wasn't able to do this. And this bred, I think, a lot of mistrust between Kabul and the Central Asian states and the United States and some of the Central Asian states. And I don't mean sort of in a bad way, but just, a, uh, I mean, this isn't a bad way, but in terms of the confidence that people had in the United States to get this job done, that the US, the presence of the United States was actually breeding insecurity. And so the longer the US was there, the worse these outcomes were. Yes, uh, there was a great prediction so that, that we saw the tempo of these attacks in the North increasing. And so um, after the fall of the Taliban government, uh, after the fall of the Ghani government, we saw great predictions of humanitarian crisis that would engulf the Central Asian states. We haven't seen that. We have not seen refugee flows come to Central Asia. We saw predictions of the humanitarian crisis that would engulf the border. We haven't seen that yet. Um, I'm not sure we'll see the humanitarian uh, the refugee flows because Central Asia has never been a place in the imagination of Afghans who seek to migrate. Uh, there are well-trodden paths of migration and, and, and sadly Afghans have been forced to migrate for the past 40 years and there are well-established networks of migration and Central Asia just is not in the collective imagination as a place to go because the borders have been so closed. Now, as we see increasing hunger and increasing humanitarian crises inside of uh, Afghanistan, this may be the case, but I'm really skeptical that we'll begin to see this. Um, but what we are seeing is hugely divergent approaches from the frontline states. So rather than seeing disruptions between the pre-August period and the post-August period, what we're seeing is real continuity in foreign policy from these states towards Afghanistan. And to me, this means that the states of Central Asia were actually quite prepared for what happened. Certainly was unexpected. Certainly it rattled uh, capitals and, and created a sense of uncertainty, but there is a great preparation that all of these states have to engage the Taliban and confront the situation as it exists today. So we know that Turkmenistan has been quietly engaged with the Taliban uh, for many, many years. They have you know, welcomed uh, Taliban delegations uh, over the past three or four years. Uh, Tajikistan had meetings with the Taliban in Doha sort of very privately, but never had a very warm relationship with the Taliban. Um, and this period of confrontation, um, I, I think is stemming from several things that the, the Tajik government, and I'd be curious to hear what all of you have to say about this, but we see Rahman in a very precarious situation inside of Tajikistan. We see growing nationalism inside of Tajikistan that I think um, was really on display last summer during the conflagration on the kyrgyz tajik border. And so a real rise of Tajik nationalism that is allowing the president really to distract from pressing international concerns, gain some international good grace, but also a real concern about the Taliban, right? There are real legitimate concerns that the Tajik government has about the Taliban because of the role that Tajik militants are playing inside of Northern Afghanistan. And we can talk about, talk about that a little during the discussion. And then finally, we have Uzbekistan. And while we've seen these really extraordinary pictures coming out of Kabul, where we see a uh, foreign minister Kamilov, um, he was in Kabul last week, these uh, two weeks ago, uh, these pictures of him meeting with Taliban delegations, this has been going on for quite some time, uh, that Uzbekistan has had a very forward leaning um, position with the Taliban and not afraid of negotiation. And in fact, Kamilov on his, I think it was on his Instagram page or Facebook page, he posted this picture of him with uh, Taliban officials from the 1990s. And he says, look, we've done this before. We're doing it again. We're ready. We know these people. Um, but a key difference, I think, that we're seeing from 20 years ago is that there was a great deal of apprehension about the Taliban. There was great distrust of Pakistan, for example. President Karimov was very angry with Pakistan, was very outspoken about what he saw was Pakistan's role in uh, promoting the Taliban. And uh, during his, his rule, there was pretty, there was very little 
uh, cooperation between Afghanistan and uh, Uzbekistan. That has changed now. And uh, to me, when uh, over the past, uh, over this summer, uh, there was this uh, meeting in Tashkent where all the South and Central, South Asian and Central Asian leaders were meeting. Uh, the, Uzbekistan has, you know, this is part of their uh, regional integration strategy, this ability, this desire to create a broader economic space for trade in the region. Um, in, in the presence of Ashraf Ghani, uh, the Uzbek government signed a strategic partnership with Pakistan. And when I saw that, that that strategic partnership was signed, to me, this was a sign that Uzbekistan was very comfortable with the Taliban taking power in Kabul. And that was something that happened in May or June, that conference took place. It was several months before the Taliban government. And to me, that was a huge signal that the United that uh, people were no longer looking to the United States as a, as a guarantor of security. So just to, to wrap things up here, um, we, there is no security vacuum in this region. There are 7,000 Russian troops in Tajikistan. There's an increasingly strong Uzbek military. There's a Chinese military presence that we're hearing about. And China, of course, is not too far away. We're seeing the increasing agencies of Central Asian states in engaging with the Taliban, cultivating their own foreign policy. But we can see, especially if we look at Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, that they're not afraid. Uh, President Rahman has been very aggressive in his approach with the Taliban. Uzbekistan has also been confident in their own divergent strategy uh, towards the Taliban. So certainly uh, the militant groups are a risk. Uh, the Tajik and Uzbek militants in northern Afghanistan, those present a real opportunity for the Taliban uh, to hold the, the feet of the Central Asian states to the fire, in my opinion. Um, but they also present a real, a very real risk to the states of Central Asia. Small groups doesn't take a lot of people to create a lot of disruption. Um, so I think this is a very new time. I don't think we should see this region through necessarily through the lens of great power rivalries. We need to understand the policies of these countries on their own terms. Uh, this is not about the United States. It's not about Russia. It is not about China. It is about the agency and the confidence that these countries have in cultivating future relations with Afghanistan. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Jen. Um, a lot to think about there too. And I'll have a couple of questions at the end, but I also want to remind uh, all our guests today that if you do have any questions, would you please put them in the chat box uh, and we get to those as fast as we can. And on that note, I'd also like to encourage the, the next couple of speakers to make sure you keep within your time limit so we can get to some questions too. And Akram uh, Umarov, who I, I didn't get to say hello to before this started, uh, good to see you again. And I will now give the floor over to you. Thanks a lot, a good part of the day. I'm also very privileged uh, to be invited to, to this very interesting and timely event. So I'll try to be brief and divide my kind of small intervention in, in several blocks. So I think the previous speakers excellently covered the diversity and not true diversity, but some differences in approaches of uh, regional countries to the current situation in Afghanistan. So there is no much need uh, to stop on these issues a lot. Uh, but uh, just uh, to add a bit on this, why this happened, why at, out of five uh, Central Asian countries, four exactly kind of directly uh, engaging with Taliban and having relations with it. So it's more kind of based on that pragmatic approach and consideration of real politics, which is happening in, in this country. So they were not possibly willing to see this outcome, but this is a, uh, this is a result which we have now. And this is not because of the Central Asian countries position, and we said not because of their, uh, their, their faults and difficulties. So this is something which were left for us as a burden, and we should deal with this considering our capacity and considering our existing, um, existing uh, conditions. So uh, this is more about, uh, it's a balance between opportunities from Afghanistan and potential threats. So considering all these factors, I think regional countries are building their uh, relations with Taliban uh, step by step and trying to interact with them to, in order to understand what can they do uh, in, in future. 
Of course, there are a bunch of issues which are on the agenda, the, the ones which we already mentioned, and the potential uh, expansion of terrorism. So this is not something completely new. We had seen this before in, at the end of 1990 that some original groups found uh, a, a territory to, to, uh, to be to prepare to be uh, hosted in Afghanistan to have to use as a platform for attacks. So uh, the one or the drugs issue is still on the agenda is still very important. But also the uncontrolled weaponry which were left uh, after the withdrawal of uh, Western fo forces and uh, this uh, retraction of Afghan army. So we are talking about thousands of hundreds thousands of weapons which were left uncontrolled and their fate is still unclear who are controlling them and what will be what will happen with them uh, the government itself yeah we the regional countries are interacting with uh, taliban but still it's not very predictable we can see a lot of internal divisions we can see very diverse acts which are happening by which happening by the taliban representatives when the group of taliban representatives were in Moscow yesterday trying to persuade international community that they are moderate, that they are ready for, uh, the, for the uh, interaction with them and they're asking for more uh, recognition. At the same time, Minister of Internal Affairs Hakane had a meeting with, uh, with the families of Taliban victims who committed suicides in the past. And again, he uh, repeated his position that Taliban will use all possible uh, <clears throat> all possible kind of acts in order to reach its its uh, objective. So th this is kind of very symbolic act, having a meeting with them and trying to support them in this uh, situation. So it, it also demonstrates uh, that Taliban is internally very divided and still do not have a kind of united position how to to interact with the outside world. So such meeting, having a such meeting in the circumstances when Taliban was seeking recognition as something very, which will not kind of contribute to this uh, process, I think. And humanitarian and refugee crisis. I think this is the utmost, uh, uh, should be of our, of our utmost uh, importance and attention. This is something which is happening right now. Recognition of Taliban is something which we can maybe decide slightly later. But the things which are going in Afghanistan, the people are starving, the people are uh, in a very bad condition. And I think they, this uh, issue which, where we should concentrate our efforts and provide humanitarian support uh, to the country as soon as possible. Uh, re regarding refugee crisis, uh, again, this is very uh, something very important for the region. There is a, bit, uh, a lot of discussion now and, and uh, among different Western experts and among different Western media that these refugees, in case of the flow of increase of flow of refugees, they should be hosted within the region. Yeah, and the, and the countries, uh, the, our, the international community should provide support for the region to, to host these people. Definitely, we are, we are kind of very close to Afghanistan. We have very, uh, long history, culture, many, many other stuff, which uh, demonstrates our uh, closeness to this country. Actually, these, uh, they are our brothers and sisters. But at the same time, we should consider again realities. Yeah, this, how, to what extent the region is capable to host, let's say hundreds, thousands or millions of Afghan refugees. And to what extent this is feasible in the current circumstances. And since this thinking that you should keep them in the region. We will just send you uh, several hundred million dollars or euros, and that's it. I think this is the wrong approach. We should more international cooperation and coordination, and more a fair, a tr uh, uh, fair approach to the region. If we consider again the experiences of countries like Iran and Pakistan, who have been hosting Afghan refugees for decades, millions of Afghan refugees, unfortunately. None of them are happy with this. None Iranian and Pakistani governments, none the people, Afghan citizens who are living in this country. So both, of, both sides are not happy because both sides are facing many difficulties and challenges. 
and Iran and Pakistan, I cannot say that they received a huge international support in order to, to have this, to host these people and to, to support their everyday livelihood. Uh, regarding the uh, Taliban and the current challenges with the movement is facing. So we are talking a lot about recognition of the Taliban, its acceptance as the international community's member. But I think this is, uh, uh, even the euro happened in February, 2020. So this is, <laughs> we are kind of uh, concentrating a lot on this recognition, but Taliban is officially recognized as a political force. And it was, in, it was uh, mentioned in the documents which they signed with the US that there is a high possibility that they will be at least a part of the government which will be formed very soon. So I think the, now the talks that we, should we acknowledge them or not is kind of a bit, uh, there are a lot of biases in this uh, in these uh, discussions. So about internal division, I said that we are take, we are saying Taliban movement, but as it was before, Taliban is having uh, its horizontal structure, maybe this helped Taliban to gain the power uh, quickly, but in the current circumstances, they are lacking consolidation and the internal divisions, the fact that the Taliban governments, uh, even the one which they formed, which were criticized a lot by international community for lack of inclusiveness, even it took almost once, one month for them to form this government. Again, it demonstrates the internal problems and internal divisions in the unit. So uh, also it demonstrates, it, it puts a big question to what extent is movement really independent its decisions in decision-making? Who is the real decision-maker? If we consider the fact that Pakistani GAM officials are intervening quite uh, frequently in the affairs and the, their representatives were in, the, in, the, in Kabul in the days when the government was formed. So these are some signs that Again, the, what, to what extent this movement is real decision making? Making should we directly interact with them, or should we deal more with Pakistan in order to get to some important uh, outcomes? And of course, they are facing because of this internal problem. They are facing difficulties to organize important public institutions and to provide uh, public services to its population. And uh, the, the, the terroristic acts which happened and different parts of the country again demonstrate that they are also not capable to control the situation fully. And uh, the last points uh, in Central Asia, despite our very kind of pragmatic approach, where very kind of considering the real uh, situation on the ground, I think in the region we are still uh, lacking in uh, the, the very high level of cooperation and coordination of our efforts. So, Again, uh, all kind of officials of Central Asian countries visited Kabul and had interaction with the movement on a bilateral basis. And uh, despite having a very good now platform of consultative meetings uh, between Central Asian countries, this uh, meeting was not uh, gathered after the, after the fall of Ghani regime in, uh, in mid-August. And there were no kind of purely Central Asian meeting discussing all this potential challenges and threats. Of course, we had meetings of CSCO, CSTO, and many, many other kind of for formats, Moscow format, which happened yesterday. But again, these are again are happening with the involvement of these powerful actors. Again, in order to demonstrate our agency, we should act more proactively and demonstrate that we as a region ready to have some more responsibility and we're ready to demonstrate our United position. Of course, we have internal misunderstanding, but I think that this the all common understanding of what is happening in Afghanistan is more or less united. Even Tajikistan, despite having very harsh position on the current situation regarding with Taliban, they are still continuing to provide electricity for Kabul and for the northern parts of uh, Afghanistan. So this is also a sign that Tajikistan is ready to to have some discussion with the current government. And of course, finally, I think uh, Russia is uh, benefiting a lot from this situation by strengthening its um, even more its presence in the region and having even to, to the extent that even 
in some cases they're uh, saying instead of Central Asian countries, they're trying to be a first in clearly standing the position that they will not allow US military bases in the region. It's, it was obvious, yeah, based on different positions of Central Asian countries, Uzbekistan has its internal legislation based on this. But despite this, Russia is trying kind of to be very direct in, in, in delivering this, uh, in these positions. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you very much, Akram. I appreciate it. Uh, and once more, a reminder to all our guests, if you have questions, would you please leave them in the chat box? Uh, and now we get to our, our last speaker. Uh, and I'm very happy to hand the floor over now to Tami Masi. Uh, and he's going to tell us about um, the Central Asian leaders uh, and the balance of power in Afghanistan. So please, if you would, Tami. Well, thank you very much, Bruce. It's always a pleasure um, to share this panel with such a distinguished set of panelists. Um, the views I present are really my personal views and um, reflections, research, and experience. Um, it's always difficult to be the last speaker with such distinguished set of panelists. And I, as a principal, always try to bring, uh, you know, at least in my capacity, new perspectives into whatever discussion I join. So I will try to um, give some perspectives which um, which will hopefully not be repeated here, uh, at, or at least I will try. And that will come from a real politic point of view. So I'm not an anthropologist and I will not uh, delve into an anthropological discussion of ethnic power balance in Central Asia and Afghanistan. But what I would do is essentially look at how the ethnic power dynamics between Central Asia and Afghanistan um, really shapes things in Afghanistan. And um, whether there is that good old Central Asia, you know, strong men that used to dictate things in Afghanistan, or at least took, you know, sides from um, uh, uh, of one faction against the other. Um, and, and, and I will try to be as brief as possible. Um, the, the way I would approach it is basically focus on three things. First is the shadow of history. And I do not by any means try to, um, you know, talk about Central Asian history with, here with um, some very distinguished people, but um, basically see how history shaped um, the ethnic power balance between Central Asians and Afghanistan. Then the personality called politics that existed in the 1990s and then worked with Afghan power brokers and whether that still exists in Afghanistan and you know, could be an approach. And then the, the, the differentiation or rather the comparison of state to state relations versus people to people relationship and then how ethnicity kind of uh, played a role there. So first, a few things. Um, Afghanistan is one of the most ethnically diverse countries in the world. Um, there, are, there are different estimates of 50 to 75 different ethnicities in Afghanistan. Um, uh, uh, the statistics and census is an issue. Um, the last time a proper statistics or census rather was undertaken in Afghanistan was during our king's time. And at that time it put, uh, you know, I would call there's no um, absolute majority in Afghanistan, 50 plus uh, ethnicity, which controls or, or has the population. Um, but if you look at it, uh, essentially the dominant or big minority, as I call it, the big minority dominant group are the Pashtuns and then um, the other 54 plus ethnicities, um, Tajiks, Uzbeks, you know, Aymaks and others uh, that are there. And then if you uh, put the, the population weight uh, of each of these ethnicities uh, into the political theater and their relationship with Central Asia, um, you, you basically um, find out or you basically look into, uh, one of the ways to look into the relationships um, is the patron client relationship uh, from a security perspective, trade perspective, um, and, and cultural relations perspective between our one ethnic groups and, and the Central Asian groups. Um, and that's the lens I would try to um, delve in here, um, uh, that how the Afghan Uzbeks interact with Uzbeks in Uzbekistan, 
how the Afghan Turkmens interacted with Turkmens in, in, in uh, Turkmenistan, um, um, and the same with Tajiks and others. Now, um, uh, as I mentioned, I will delve into this, this from a security perspective. Uh, essentially, um, if you look at it historically, uh, this issue of sanctuary has been always a dilemma, both for Afghan ethnic groups, as well as for Central Asian, now well, newly formed Central Asian groups of the previously the Hanets, the different dissident groups um, were given refuge or safe havens in one, um, in either in Afghanistan region or in the Central Asian uh, regions. And if you look at it from that perspective, um, right now uh, in Afghanistan, uh, the Central Asians um, accept the, the basic fear of a um, Islamic jihadist uh, group emerging to threaten their nationalism, uh, they really don't have um, a favor. Um, you, uh, you see, you know, the Tajik uh, president, uh, uh, Imam Ali Rahmanov, um, trying to play that uh, strongman, big, uh, uh, you know, patron politics, but um, he lacks the, the financial capacity, the political capacity, and the military acumen uh, to be able to play that role for the Tajiks in Afghanistan. Um, if you look at Uzbeks from that client patron uh, relationship, um, the government of Uzbekistan, they have a very reformist government now. I mean, Islam Karimov is no longer there to send advisors and financial and military support to Dostum. Uh, and then uh, basically, essentially uh, babysit him um, on, on various um, um, po political military dealings. Um, the Turkmen president, uh, Turkmenistan's president, he is really focused uh, on ensuring um, that you know, his country diversifies, as you all know, his, uh, the economic base, but also the transfer of power to his son. So Afghanistan, um, for him, uh, other than a transit route, um, there is no particular group that the Turkmen president would uh, bet on and, and kind of um, um, and in spite of, you know, it's neutrality foreign policy, the, the neutrality policy of it. Uh, but the, uh, the, there is no um, particular favorites that Turkmenistan has. Same go goes for Kazakhstan and, and Kyrgyzstan. Um, um, so essentially, um, I think what they are really afraid um, a lot of these Central Asians, uh, if you look at it from that historical safe haven, dissidents uh, uh, refuge lens, um, uh, uh, they are afraid of a new generation of Islamist nationalist uh, uh, Tajiks or Uzbek, uh, uh, Uzbeks emerging uh, that could threaten uh, their national security. Uh, whereas uh, on the Afghan side, they really don't have any favorites. Um, so there are no dostums anymore. There is no, um, uh, at least for the Uzbeks, for example. For Tajiks, it's really Masood's son. And, um, and I think that's pretty much it because Amrullah Saleh and others have really lost their legitimacy in the eyes of the Tajiks. Um, and, and, um, but uh, even before the Tajiks, when they engage from this client patron relationship um, uh, in Afghan um, power politic dynamics, was with the help of the Russians and the Indians with the base which was there. And that the, the clarity is also not there how much the Tajik president uh, has the financial resources and the military resources to be able to leverage that through umbrellas, uh, through um, Ahmad Massoud and you know others. Uh, to uh, change the, dyna the ethnic dynamics um, uh, within Afghanistan. Um, the other thing which is important, I think, that, that needs to be taken into account is um, the strongman politics um, that used to be um, the fashion in Central Asia as well as in Afghanistan, um, except maybe President uh, Imam Ali Rahmanov, um, uh, everybody else um, has no interest um, right now um, to getting involved in that strongman politics in Afghanistan. Um, and that is why one, that's one of the reasons they're engaging with the Taliban right now. I think one of the things that a lot of us should really watch for 
is the new generation of Uzbeks who are fighting under the banner of the Taliban. And one of the interesting cases for me is the new Northern Court commander of the Taliban. Uh, he's an Uzbek. He fought um, uh, against um, Dostum and Dostum forces. He is sitting at Dostum's house right, right now. I mean, his base is there. And um, um, relatively young in his late 30s, and he is inspiring um, a whole new generation of Uzbeks and, um, uh, and Turkmens and, and others uh, in northern Afghanistan that you could um, um, basically break this uh, taboo of, of, of the, the invincibility of Dostum and, and others. So, um, and I'm sorry to give the example of Dostum, but it's, it's the same true with Hazaras. Uh, there are Taliban Hazaras uh, uh, who, are, um, um, who have fought in areas who were previously Muhaqqit and Halili used to fight. There is um, the famous Qari Fasiuddin from Badakhshan, who is now the chief of army staff of the Taliban. He is a Tajik. Um, and um, he, he is being counterbalanced as this Islamist nationalist, as opposed to Amrullah Saleh or Masood, somebody who could defy them, but under the Taliban brand. I think this is something that the Central Asians are very, at least their security institutions, are very worried about that um, this sort of new idols and examples in the battlefield could inspire um, similar sort of characters in Central Asia, in spite of Russian presence, in spite of um, you know, Chinese drone base in Tajikistan, in spite of other things, because they could draw inspirations and it, has, it is already um, um, drawing inspirations uh, as we see it. The other thing which is important and, and is not, not much attention is being paid, uh, paid to it, is this increasing uh, military suicide uh, squads that the Taliban are forming of Tajiks and Uzbeks and then deploying them in the borders of these countries. In the last two, in the last uh, two to three weeks, Taliban have announced the formation of suicide bomber, Tajik suicide squad, um, uh, uh, bomber squad, and deployed them in Badakhshan uh, because Imam Ali Rahmanov was making certain movements. And then I'm now told that they are also forming uh, Uzbek, um, similar Uzbek military squads, uh, uh, and might deploy them in, in Uzbek border. Now, that could, those could be posturing, um, but at the same time, we see how Taliban and Islamic ideological umbrella is using the ethnic card and instrumentalizing ethnicity for its global or regional jihadist um, 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 uh, 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 objectives. Now, um, the other perspective which I wanted to give, and then I will I'll probably stop here, um, and, and then maybe we could discuss things in more detail later. It is that all politics for Central Asian states and all security for Central Asian states, when it comes to Afghanistan, is local. Um, we hear a lot of these meetings of this foreign minister of this Central Asian state visited this place or the chairman of the National Security Council of that foreign uh, of that Central Asian state visited Kabul or met with Taliban representatives in Qatar or Doha. But in reality, if you go on the ground, um, as was mentioned by Professor Murtashvili and uh, other speakers here, um, the Taliban have uh, the Central Asian security establishment have already been in touch with the Taliban for over many years, at least some of them for seven years um, that I know of, uh, given my experience dealing with the security sector in Afghanistan. And they have been patronizing, supporting local power brokers along their borders, uh, whether in Western Afghanistan, in Northern Afghanistan, um, in, in any parts of uh, there, and through support, through giving them weapons, through giving them um, energy, free gas, um, you know, through giving them uh, other incentives and, and basically patronizing them, not only to secure the border uh, or serve as some sort of a deterrence policy against other uh, players which could threaten their security, but at the same time 
to use them as buffer uh, method, uh, as a buffer uh, uh, mechanism to ensure um, that not only their border is secure, but the local um, power brokers is in a way in their uh, favor um, and, and, and secures um, their border. Now, Taliban, through deploying these different forces, which are of that particular ethnicity um, uh, in the border, in the border area of Central Asian states, is actually trying to change that dynamic. And Taliban, in a quiet way, is also signaling to the Central Asian security establishment that if you really don't listen to us, um, you are in for trouble. So they're leveraging that, uh, these forces, um, uh, or the, the threat of insecurity and, and instability at their borders um, as a way, um, as hardball diplomacy, if I could put it that way. Um, I, and I will um, conclude um, uh, uh, briefly. Um, that I think it's too early to call the shot when it comes to the Central Asian uh, and Afghanistan um, ethnic and security dynamics. Um, a lot we are we are in for a for a critical um, juncture in history, uh, as as Dr. Ariel Cohen mentioned, uh, which the likes of it we might not see, uh, or we have we probably have seen it once or twice in the entire history. Um, and uh, the new model of jihadist nationalist power, which emerged in Afghanistan, could inspire and is already inspiring uh, jihadist groups and extremist uh, Islamist groups to see if they could replicate that in the Fergana Valley um, and in Central Asian states and, um, and even beyond in Russia. Um, and Taliban are nurturing these people. Taliban are not taking action, um, like you know, um, uh, like previously when the bus matured or the Dushman, you know, uh, eras. Taliban are actually nurturing them and using them as a leverage, and they still harbor the um, dream of establishing a Central Asian mini khilafat, if nothing else. Thank you. Okay, yeah, great. Thanks, Tamim. Um, I have the honor of getting to ask the first question. Unfortunately, someone else is asking nearly an identical question right now. So and this one is for Dr. Cohen and possibly Akram to start with. And we have one for Tamim coming up. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, you could say the developments in the last 20 years have really been a success story in, in linking Central Asia to Afghanistan, railroads, electrical power, you know, power lines, things like that. Um, you know, and now they're in a situation where there's a, it's kind of use it or lose it at this point. Um, so, I mean, given the new realities, 20 years ago, it was easy to decouple from Afghanistan. There weren't very many links. But in the last 20 years, a lot of that has been, a lot of infrastructure has been developed. Um, you know, do you think that helps to account for the new approach that some of the Central Asian governments are taking, particularly Uzbekistan, because most of the land transportation, uh, all, in fact, I think all of it ends up going through Uzbekistan and into Afghanistan, except for small roads. So. Uh, doesn't this weigh on the minds of Central Asian leaders when they're trying to formulate a, a policy toward Afghanistan, what happened, that they are in fact connected when they were not before? Dr. Cohen, could you unmute? <laughs> Sorry. Apologies, yes. Uh, thank you for the excellent question. This is something I work on a lot, and uh, it is of a great interest uh, for companies, for the U.S. government, for Chinese government, etc. And herein lies the rub. Does the Taliban leadership, can, can it reform it the way it thinks? Can it shift from being a militant and military leadership and become a business leadership. Praise the Lord, alhamdulillah, in Afghanistan, every leader is a businessman and a military leader. So we hope that they will shift gears and become business leaders and listen to what companies are saying or governments are saying that the people of Afghanistan can improve their livelihood they can benefit from billions of dollars in tariffs, 
uh, they can get jobs, uh, but you cannot, uh, you know, have your cake uh, and eat it too. You cannot have both. You're either a, a state builder or you are a warrior. And um, what Tamim Asay said is absolutely true. The Taliban and others, it's not just the Taliban, are building tools that have military implications and military capacity. And unfortunately, Jen Murtazashvili left, but she, when she's telling me, oh, uh, the, the regional leaderships uh, are secure and um, there's 7,000 Russian troops there, there were 100,000 of American troops. Little good did it do to us and to the people of Afghanistan. And my message is, if you do not build a military, special forces, intelligence apparatus of equal or higher value to what, to what the Taliban can deploy, your best ideas about the railroad and the electric um, high voltage lines uh, and the uh, famous uh, never ending project of the uh, TAPI, uh, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, gas pipeline from Tajikistan. It will be a pipe dream. You need to deter the Talib leadership so that they know if they try to mess with you, they and their families will pay the price. The price will be too high for them to go the way of military engagement. And therefore, they will have to seriously commit themselves to railroads, to high voltage electricity, uh, to regular roads, work with the Chinese. Unfortunately, Americans are out now. Work maybe with the Europeans, of course, with the Uzbeks and with the others to build a whole new Afghanistan. And if you ask me, that is exactly the wrong leadership to accomplish that goal. Sorry about that. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Kram, I don't see you on the screen, but up there. Um, yeah, your take on that. I mean, is it, are we too, too far along here for the Uzbek government to take any other stance than the one it has been taking of engagement with the Taliban, considering how closely connected and how much better connected they are right now? Yes, thanks for this question. It's a really interesting one. I think, uh, uh, of course, these projects already existing and planned ones, of course, they're affecting on the agenda of Tashkent on how to interact with Taliban. These are all definitely considered while the decisions made on the ways to engage with Taliban and how to kind of build our position and policy regarding to this country in the new realities. Uh, so, uh, but uh, my, my colleague uh, Tamim definitely mentioned very interesting points about this leverage which Taliban is trying to build in order to kind of influence Central Asian countries. But I think from the side of the region, they, this region also has some leverage. Yeah, that the, the, this infrastructure which we have, the support which are, we are providing, these are all very important issues which I think Taliban will definitely consider before making any decision. I'm not trying to to provide this uh, the beautiful picture of Taliban, very rational decision makers and the the, the real policy uh, player. But the, again, this is a reality. Taliban is still, I agree with, with some point, the Taliban is still radical fundamentalist organization who can easily use terrorist acts in order to get to its objectives. But again, who, who should be blamed for this? Should we, should we blame Central Asian countries for having Taliban now in Kabul and now saying that well, you, you cannot provide your security if Taliban will decide to make some intervention to the region? So this is something which we can, of course, think about, but I don't think that in, in a, in a mid-term or short-term perspective, there can be such development that Taliban will start any kind of uh, 
try to be to to intervene or to try to make some military attack on Central Asian countries. This is I saw, I don't think this is in the interest of Taliban. They were in isolation in in 1990s, and I don't think they get a lot from this isolation. And now, of course, it can happen, but will Taliban kind of uh, start from this? I don't think so. The, 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 the ones who, who will be negatively affected by this, the, the ordinary people of Afghanistan. Ne, ne, in, in, each, ne, in neither in countries which were, which were under strict sanctions of international communities, the regimes were victims of these sanctions. Usually the people are the direct victims of such sanctions. Regimes are fine with such sanctions. They're living in a very good conditions. Uh, so this is my brief intervention. Great. Can I, Bruce, can I quickly make a comment? Yes, please. Just, just briefly, two to three things. Uh, first, the mistake we made uh, uh, when, when we were in the government. Um, we always think that Taliban are rational players and that they would act like a government and that um, we, we try to reimagine them in our uh, image. I think that was a big mistake we made, uh, all of us in the West, as well as you know, in Afghanistan. Um, uh, they are a stishadi uh, movement. They are praying, I mean, many, many, many stories that came out in New York Times and Wall Street Journal and the information we had at that time. Um, and now the, the, the various um, voices that you hear from them is that a lot of them are actually regretting why they were not martyred, um, why they didn't die in this fight. They're looking for another fight. Um, so one, I think we need to understand Taliban better. We need to, and, and the movement uh, as an umbrella movement, which by the way, harbors many other groups inside that, including many of the Central Asians. Secondly, the response of the previous government to all um, uh, you know, uh, uh, extremist and religious agendas, as well as some of the security and ethnic issues were let's integrate them through military and through state building. Let's have come up with these big economic projects. And maybe if we offer them all sorts of economic um, incentives and integrate the region better, then we will actually be able to address the problem. Um, yes, it worked to some extent, but most of the times I think we, we failed in that. And that's why none of these projects actually went anywhere. And to tell you, and, and mind you, that the TAPI project started uh, during the Taliban time, uh, and, and they actually take credit for it. The third thing, and the last thing I would mention is this estranged brother syndrome look at Afghan ethnicities by the Central Asians. They look at Afghan Tajiks, Afghan Uzbeks as this um, little brother who needs help or who needs to be shunned away. And that is why, or, or is this traditional backward um, um, lens that they look at Afghan um, ethnic um, Uzbeks or ethnic um, Tajiks or ethnic Turkmens or ethnic Kyrgyz um, or, or Kazakhs or, or IMOX. Uh, and that plays into the national narrative um, of, of Afghans that our Central Asian brother, and yes, we speak the same language, we're culturally, religiously, so on and so forth are connected, but a lot of these economic projects are really for their benefit. And therefore this top, uh, this down, down look at us uh, will not take us anywhere except that we will be a transit point. Mm -hmm. And we have felt that in our negotiations when, when many of us went to different Central Asian states as Afghan negotiators, um, that um, this top, down look at us uh, didn't really, you know, uh, play well into our psyche. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Tamin. And I, I'm coming right back to you. And I apologize, I'm gonna have to leave in five minutes. This is a great discussion. But um, we have a question in, in the box. And I've been wondering about this too. You've spoken about the Tajiks and, and Uzbeks in northern Afghanistan. Uh, our other speakers have also mentioned this too. And we've heard that there's uh, you know, militants who are citizens of Central Asian countries, but are ethnic Tajiks and ethnic Uzbeks. 
what chance do you see that the, that these groups that are and some of whom are whom are armed in northern Afghanistan will not be able to cooperate with the Taliban government? Uh, they're not very well integrated. We did see an ethnic Uzbek come to Termez leading the delegation a couple of days ago, but the Taliban are generally looked upon as, as Dr. Cohen said, as a Pashtun movement. Um, do you see any potential for unrest caused by the ethnic groups in the north um, who feel that they're underrepresented, which is something that the Tajik government, actually all the Central Asian governments have talked about, uh, inclusive government, but I, it, on paper, it doesn't look that way. Well, when I was in the government, it was a couple of years ago, um, we, we traveled extensively to Russia and Central Asia. Uh, the first thing is uh, there are hundreds of Central Asian experienced fighters in Afghanistan. And, when, and, and they were, most of them were in our prisons, in the republics, previous republics prisons. Um, uh, uh, because we got them either at the battlefield or, or, or you know, in different arenas. The first problem with those prisoners were first, very battle hardened, very experienced. Secondly, the fiercest of fighters. Thirdly, many of them used Afghanistan as a staging ground. And fourthly, which I must say here, is that a lot of these Central Asian states, because of that strange brother syndrome, disowned them. They told us that these are uh, Afghan Tajiks, Afghan Uzbeks, Afghan um, Chechens, I don't know, Afghan Kazakhs, Afghan Kyrgyz. Um, they literally disowned them. And then when Taliban came and they pursued the open door policy of the prisons, all of these battle hardened Central Asian fighters are out now. And I must tell you that most of the times when they fought the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces, they were the fiercest of fighters and they would fight until the last man. Um, and, and that was what it was. Now, have Taliban taken any action against them? No, because mostly these people are, are, were the technical advisors to the Taliban in, in terms of bomb making, in terms of battlefield planning, in terms of you know, other specialized skill that Taliban laymen didn't have. Secondly, they were also mediators between various Taliban fighting factions. So whenever the Afghans fought, it was, uh, depending on which ethnicity, uh, one of these Central Asian or Arabs used to come and mediate between the Taliban local factions, and then the, the, the fight would be over. Um, so that symbiotic relationship with mutual dependency, um, and plus now that the victory is secure, will make it very hard for the Taliban to take action against these people who actually helped them um, to get to victory. Now, um, I think the least or, or the best we could expect out of the Taliban in terms of actions against Central Asian fighters is a code of conduct, because that is what they're doing with TTP, that, that's what they will do with the IMU, that's what they will do with Ansarullah of Tajikistan, you know, and a and, and dozen other groups which, which are operating or foreign fighters which are operating under their umbrella, is that they would go and tell the Central Asian states, we will, okay, fine, uh, these people we will ensure will not attack you, we can give you a guarantee, and then a code of conduct, a two-pager will, will be issued to them and basically say, okay, you need to move out of the borders of, of Tajikistan or, or Uzbekistan and come live in Kabul or come live in Logar or, or in Wardak, and then uh, you need to follow these guidelines. But no um, military or, or, or security action would be taken against them because that would create a civil war within the Taliban of foreign fighters against the local fighters, which is a, a jihadi fratricide, a, a jihadi cannibalism in a way uh, uh, that will start. And, and then ISIS will use that. Uh, right now, we see a lot of the northern commanders um, of, of Taliban, as well as some of the um, Central Asian um, terror groups joining ISIS because they consider Taliban now as less of a Muslim, and uh, that they are uh, that they made this deal with the Americans, and this transition from a militia to a government will cost a lot for the Taliban because now they have to start delivering rule of law and services and start taking action against these people, and then when they start taking even minimalistic action, it will fill up 
the, uh, uh, the, 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 the ranks of uh, Daesh. And that's why you see Daesh increasingly you know, being active in Afghanistan. Okay, great. And with that, I'm afraid I have to go, but I'm going to turn it over to, to Abhan Sultan, Sultan Nazarov. I uh, appreciate it very much, and I wish you all a very good day and, and good weekend. Uh, thank you very much, Bruce. For much appreciated. Uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, we have uh, one. I have a two finger um, uh, Abhan, if I can add something to what Tamim said before. Can I? Yes, please. Okay. Um, when the U.S. government took its decision in 2006 to allow uh, elections in Gaza, and the Palestinian Authority, the Israeli government, Egypt, and others warned the U.S., don't do that. If you do that, Hamas will take over. And the U.S. government said, we're in favor of democracy. And Hamas once it comes and gets elected, if it gets elected, they will worry about the potholes, filling the potholes on the road, running the uh, water supply, running the electric system, et cetera, et cetera. And somebody called it the pothole theory of governance. Ladies and gentlemen, this was 40, 15 years ago. I have news for you the pothole theory of government doesn't work so well. The mentality of a fighter, be it Hamas, be it Taliban, be it, I, Hamas is the Ihwan, they're Muslim Brotherhood. They're, they wear suits. They have college degrees. A lot of them are engineers and they still don't fill the potholes. They would rather build the Qassam rockets and launch them on Israeli villages and towns and kill Arabs and Jews. Right? Still in Gaza, you have Hamas that comes to agreements with Egyptians or with the Israelis, ceasefires, whatever, and you have Islamic Jihad. And there is that friction between a radical and ultra radical uh, Islamist group. And I'm afraid that number one, we'll see another confirmation how the pothole theory of governance will not work because to build that poppy pipeline, to build that high voltage um, electricity line, to extend the railroad like our Uzbek friends want from Mazari to Kabul, to Peshawar, to Gwadar, you need engineers. You need business managers with MBAs. You need people who understand business of building, not business of killing. And I just don't see the personnel for that. Uh, and yes, we will see friction between the equivalent of Hamas, in this case, the Taliban, and the Islamic Jihad, in this case, Islamic Jihad, or uh, ISIS, or um, some other uh, ultra-radical group. And yes, they'll point fingers at each other. I love the term uh, that Tamim made, the uh, jihadi cannibalism. We will see that. But that is a sad, sad story for the people of Afghanistan. Thank you very much, Dr. Cohen. There is a question from, uh, hold on, please. Francesco. Yeah, Francesca almost. She's asking, to what extent do the speakers think that the economic and connectivity projects like electricity, railway, uh, gas pipeline are driving the approach of the Central Asian countries in regards to Afghanistan? Dr. Cohen, maybe you would start and then I would ask uh, Dr. Omarov to continue. Uh, yes, and I have to be brief because we are out of time and I have another appointment to run to. Um, if the question is, can you, can you repeat the question again? Uh, the question is that to what extent do the speakers think that the economic and connectivity projects like electricity, railway, yeah. gas pipeline are driving the approach of the Central Asian country in regards to Afghanistan? 
I think that for Uzbekistan, I was in Tashkent in July, talked to very senior people. Uh, they would love to have it. Uh, the Chinese would love to build that um, uh, corridor uh, to the Indian Ocean because it allows them uh, to put a chokehold around India through Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, so there are powerful players who are interested in that. However, I think what drives the policy of the Central Asian governments is engagement, is understanding, is building relationships, maybe building uh, some ways to find informal arrangements, shall we say, uh, with the leaders in Kabul, but lacking the military and security and intelligence dimension, they will be at a disadvantage. So if they ask me, which they don't, but if they ask me, I say, yeah, sure, engage them, tell them that how wonderful that uh, railroad is going to be, how terrific the pipeline is going to be. Look, Afghanistan doesn't have enough power. Pakistan doesn't have enough power. Build the pipeline from Turkmenistan, diversify for Turkmenistan where it can ship gas because now they depend on China. Russia has too much gas. Russia is not interested in Turkmen gas. So if they sell gas to Pakistan and made it be eventually to India, they'll be better off. And of course, the government in Kabul will have a massive uh, revenue from uh, the transit fees. If they manage to sell it, more power to them, but you need security. Security is a sine qua non for any kind of investment, any kind of economic development. There's a saying in New York, business is a coward. When there is shooting, there's no investment. So if they manage to get the relationship, build the relationship, with the Taliban and they're investing, they're going out of their way to invest in that relationship. If they manage more power to them, at this point, I'm pessimistic, but I'm hopeful, you know, may Allah give them peace, as they say. So if they manage, they will be successful and it'll be better for the people of, of Afghanistan. At the same time, my advice, build up your muscle so that they know that if the trade fails, they have other options and build up an alternative religious theological narrative. This is not only a clash of arms. It is a war of ideas. One vision of Islam in Central Asian Islam is more moderate, more enlightened. It produced great thinkers and Ibn Sina and Farabi and all these wonderful people, the type of radical interpretation that we see coming out of the madrasas in Pakistan and in India is something that Central Asians need to keep in mind and build defenses again against that as well. And with that, thank you so much. Unfortunately, I have to go. It was thank a wonderful- much. Thank Wonderful you conversation. Dr. Thank you. Dr. Marov, your thoughts, please. Yes, thanks a lot. I think I, I've uh, slightly touched upon this issue in my previous interventions. So uh, the, what, the one thing I would like to, uh, to add uh, to my previous point, that uh, each Central Asian country, not just Central Asia, all neighbors of Afghanistan doing excellent job and bilateral level. So. All neighbors are providing support to Afghanistan, humanitarian support. support. They, have, they have built infrastructure, electricity, railroad. Yeah, now the Uzbek railroad is not unique. You have, we have a railroad from, uh, from uh, Turkmenistan, Iran. So these are excellent projects. Yeah, they, they have contributed a lot to the development of infrastructure inside of Afghanistan, contributed to the uh, increase of bilateral trade with these countries. But what I think we are, we are missing while we're analyzing these projects, that um, by, in, by building these projects, we are investing a lot in our bilateral relations and contributing to the development of these neighboring provinces of Afghanistan. But at the same time, the, the problem we are missing this internal 
unity and integration of Afghanistan. So these regions, these provinces are more dependent, are more linked to the neighboring countries. Rather, they, they, are, they have a more uh, comprehensive trade exchange, other type of exchange with provinces of Afghanistan. So if there is no economic integration unity and disengagement of Afghan provinces themselves. So I think this is something if we and this will be helpful for the for building this internal uh, integration and unity of, of Afghanistan. And the projects which Central Asian countries are continuing to discuss with the Taliban, it's obvious that they will not be realized in the near perspective. But uh, the fact that we they, they are raising these projects means that they are still committed and they want the Taliban to know that they should consider this project and the Central Asian countries will follow, uh, with, will continue. Uh, thank you very much, Akram. I think we have some uh, problem with your communication. So there is another question to Tamim. Uh, so Jay Park is asking that if Tajiks and uh, Uzbeks uh, uh, would fail with, uh, you know, this uh, option of talks and cooperation with Taliban, uh, would they seek to create uh, balkanization, like creating a buffer zone such as South Ossetia, East Ukraine, Abkhazia by Russia, uh, and supporting, let's say, North Afghanistan, where the ethnic Uzbeks and Tajik live. So thank you. Um, and I will also have to um, make a move after and, uh, and, and leave this conversation. This is very important and, and attractive and, and interesting conversation for another event. But to answer that question, uh, first, Afghanistan have never had in its history a secessionist movement by the drive by ethnicity, language, region. Um, so the sense of togetherness, in spite of odds, has always been very strong. So the chances of balkanization of Afghanistan um, are, are very, very slim if I could put it this way. The reason, one of the reasons why Taliban haven't seen much of a resistance in Northern Afghanistan and they swept throughout across Afghanistan is precisely um, because they integrated um, local Tajiks, local Uzbeks, local Turkmens, local Aymaks, you know, different ethnicities into their ranks. And they use religion as an organizing principle. So it's not really ethnicity that brings Taliban together. Yes, they're predominantly Pashtuns. Uh, and I must say that Taliban is not a nationalist movement. Taliban is a, um, is a religious movement uh, with a predominant Pashtun presence. And then there are other ethnicities who have joined Taliban based on religious ideologies. Pakistan have been using the religious card against Afghan nationalism. Um, and it seems to have, uh, you know, in a way prevailed. Um, and you see that the Central Asians are, on the other hand, against, you know, a religious extremist derive in Afghanistan, because that would create instability for them. And there you see them at odds. But that would not lead to a balkanization or secessionist movements in Afghanistan. And this is not the first time in Afghan history when Afghanistan has been at this critical juncture. We have had dozens of these episodes. And every time Afghanistan, everybody said oh, Afghanistan could disintegrate or oh, Afghanistan could um, you know, go towards uh, frictions based uh, on, on ethnic lines or you know, on, on regional lines. But it never happened because of that strong sense of togetherness. Um, in the entire history of Afghanistan, if you look at it, and it's a long history, um, we have never had um, credible, and when I say credible and uh, a cr with a critical mass movement of secessionist movements or 
you know, people who um, who, who would, uh, um, you know, who'd like uh, division along ethnic and, and, and religious lines. Uh, the problem is uh, that the, the underlying driver of the conflict in Afghanistan, unlike Balkan and another place as well, I shouldn't be saying that unlike Balkans because it, it also had lots of foreign, uh, you know, um, inter interventions. You had essentially in Afghanistan, it's not a civil war, it's a proxy geopolitical war with foreign enable, foreign sponsors or foreign external donors and internal enablers or hands. And, and that is what is being played out um, uh, based on, on religious and, uh, and religious cards, uh, on religious cards. And ethnicity has not been a very much a strong driver of the conflict in Afghanistan. It has been an underlying factor oftentimes used as a mobilizing uh, factor for elites and politicians. Um, but it seems that the, the religious cult have overtaken and, and they're now uh, in a more, you know, predominant role. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, Akram, Tamim, we, we have last question, a uh, very short answer, and then uh, we'll close this uh, great event. So there is a question from Anna asking that, Despite mentioning differences among Central Asia states regarding the Taliban, is there any consensus or, I mean, implemented strategy on uh, groups such as ISIS, Khorasan, and other independent radical actors besides relying on the capacity of Kabul uh, to tame them? Thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, question. Uh, I don't think that we have a kind of united strategy in Central Asia on, on, on tackling ISIS Khorasan. And of course, this is something which, which is quite often discussed on different level of meetings. But uh, because of very kind of very initial stage of enhancing regional cooperation, I think we, do, we haven't reached yet to the stage to have a regional strategy on countering uh, this kind of uh, organizations, but I think there is a, uh, some uh, united uh, approach within the other bigger international organizations like Shanghai Cooperation Organization, yeah, which has uh, its regional anti-terrorist structure, which is based in Tashkent. I think within these institutions, we are more or less discussing these issues, but it's, it's clear that uh, this, or this organization, this terrorist group is considered as a threat by all Central Asian countries, and it was uh, directly uh, messaged by different level of officials during uh, their speeches and interventions on international events. But regarding their presence in Afghanistan, I think uh, the, at the same time, definitely this is a big threat, uh, but uh, the problem with, with this organization is the assessment of the, the, the presence is quite difficult. Yeah, we, we have so broad numbers on their presence. Some experts say that there are a few hundred people. Uh, the Russian officials say that there are tens of thousands ISIS uh, followers in Afghanistan. So it depends on how to look and where from to look on this organization. But it's, it's clear that uh, ISIS usually, now uh, in the recent years, it's used as a kind of uh, opposite side of Taliban. Maybe I don't know. To some extent, it's it's also contributing to the legitimization of Taliban as a force, as a capable force to and to to counter ISIS. So we have seen this activization of ISIS, especially before this uh, talks with the United States negotiations, and now the the second stage of activization of this organization at the period when Taliban came to the power. It seemed that it, they are demonstrating the incapability of Taliban to deliver security, but at the same time, these are just initial incidents which happened. That if Taliban could quickly demonstrate that they can fix the situation, it can also uh, contribute to the kind of on the, on the basket of Taliban having a good uh, leverage in, in, in their interaction with the outside world to contribute to its quicker legitimization. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Akram. And due to time limitation, Tamim, your last comments and we'll make a conclusion. Thank you. Very quickly. Um, first, um, 
Central Asia, like South Asia, is, the, is one of the regions infested with uh, collective organizations, but with little to show. Um, um, they are good at uh, convening conferences and meetings and photo ops and with little delivery. And I'm sorry to be very blunt. I, I have to be because I've seen many of those. Uh, secondly, when was the last time Central Asia had any united um, position on anything? Uh, I mean, even, even in Afghanistan. Uh, let, let alone Afghanistan. Um, and I think maybe it's something that they should uh, work on and, and uh, you know, develop it. Thirdly, um, the ISKP um, presence in Afghanistan and Central Asian you know, posture towards it. Um, ISKP right now does not control a single province in Afghanistan or even a single district. They are sleeper cells and their nature in Afghanistan is essentially that of an intelligence driven um, initiative rather than an ideological driven. Um, majority of Afghans are Sunni Hanafis, they are not um, uh, uh, Wahhabis. And um, Afghanistan um, it is very different than the Gulf states where ISIS really nurtured, um, both demographically and in many other uh, ways. So if any ISIS presence um, develops in Afghanistan, it will be outside of that. It will be from inside Taliban and inside other extremist groups who would love to see um, a, a change of flag for new sponsors uh, or um, a new way to pursue global jihad and khilafah. So um, I think it's a discussion we could have at another time of what Daesh or, or ISKP is after. But in the, in the, in the near uh, term future, um, I believe that the ISKP threat is exaggerated and magnified for political and geopolitical reasons and for security reasons. Uh, um, and if Taliban go uh, in another direction, then from within the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and other foreign fighters, you will see a new group of people basically changing classes and emerging as an ISKP under a new brand. Uh, thank you very much. So, well, to summarize, I think it was a truly important meeting. I think I can speak for all and say this panel was timely and extremely informative, analyzing the Afghan crisis uh, through the lens of collective identity of the region is of utter importance to have one straightforward message. Central Asia matters a lot in terms of the Afghan crisis. Great powers attempt in Afghanistan never truly solve the, the problem. And there is no fit for all solution, of course. However, we must realize that Afghanistan is part of our region. It's our neighbor. It has ethnic dias uh, diasporas, uh, diasporas of Tajiks and Uzbeks, and we share many cultural traits. So the Central Asia region has to be at the forefront of fighting the ways uh, uh, ways out of uh, the immediate situation. Afghanistan has become a major security and peacekeeping uh, factor regionally as well, not just for Central Asia. In this regard, substantive attention has to be given uh, to building pragmatic approach to regional cooperation to have a mutual agenda. Uh, presently, some Central Asians are sympathizing to those dangerous propagandist, me uh, propagandist messages coming from the current ruling power regime in the country. So we'll have to deal with the sequences of it too. So having discussed some of the near future prospects of what our uh, political elites can do to influence the state in Afghanistan is key. And here, I thank our brilliant uh, panelists for providing the conceptual overview of the problem. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to everyone who joined uh, our event today, specifically to chair of the today's event, Brice Panner, uh, Panner for facilitating the discussion and raising um, many important questions. And of course, our panel speakers, Dr. Eric Cohen, who shared his expressions of the problem at hand, the internal dynamics of power relations in Afghanistan, and the regional challenges for Central Asia associated with Afghan problem and provided very precise recommendations. Dr. Jennifer Murtazashvili, who detailed some of the aspects of the problem and stressed the importance of Central Asia's agency 
the significance of central Eurasia as an entity and the uh, centrality of Afghanistan for it. Dr. Akram Omarov, who touched upon the potential threats for Central Asia and the opportunities the Central Asian region could use to influence the crisis resolution. And lastly, Mr. Tamim Asi, who illuminated us as a practitioner about the power balance in Afghanistan and brought new, new real politic perspectives on power dynamics in the country. I see here the Norwegian ministry's representatives are present here today. So I would like to thank again you for the continued support that you provide to us. I hope everyone enjoys today's discussion. Uh, very soon we'll have the records and highlights of this event in uh, our analytical platform, Kabar.Asia. And thank you very much all for your participation. It's appreciated.